Man, well, there's only five, oh, there's six in class now. All right, well, anyways, I guess I'm over time to start. Um, so we're on to chapter five. Uh, this is not on the test that's due today. And in general, if anyone has any issues, I haven't got any emails about issues about connectivity or anything. Uh, if anything ever happens to your test, just let me know and I'll, we can figure it out. Um, also, I mean, I probably, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'll say it anyways. I went ahead and if you've noticed, I don't take off for late assignments. <laughs> so, I mean, really, it's just, uh, I, I see myself more as a coach. So, you know, like I, there's a, the two main teaching styles called stage in the stage and, and then guide on the side or coaching approach. I'm more of a coaching approach. So, although here I am talking like a sage on a stage, but I, I do see myself more as a coach. I'm, I'm coaching you guys towards the knowledge of chemistry. So, and like anything, things happen. Uh, or maybe things just sneak up on you, who knows? Combination and everything. But we're moving on next chapter. And I was gonna wear a shirt that said like beryllium then ir iridium on it and says beer. And I was like, eh, maybe I shouldn't wear that shirt. But it's okay. Yeah, I think I'll wear it next time. I don't know. But uh, it's one of my chemistry shirts. And I was thinking, eh. Because I, I remember back when rate my professor was a thing. Some students say I talk about drinking too much. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I probably shouldn't talk about drinking too much. But here I am. I'm going to talk about drinking just now. And so let's say, you know, it's Wednesday, the 22nd. And I said, ah, hump day. How, how many would you be impressed if I, you know, came here and say it was I mean, this is against the drug workplace, of course, but if I cracked open a beer, poured a glass and just said bottoms up and chugged that beer, how many of you guys would be impressed? Oh, you're not too easily impressed. What if it was vodka? What if I, what if I had the pint of vodka? Oh, if I, if I shotgun or not shotgun, or the funnel or whatever it's called, bong, I had the beer, if I had the, the vodka bong. I've done the cake stand. That was, uh, do you guys, does this cake stand still a thing or is it? I guess I don't know. Maybe I'm showing my age. What's that? Yeah. I don't think I've done a keg stand in over 20 years. Oh, okay. Huh. Well, I mean, that's something different. That's just a vessel, a keg stand. You you put your, you, you have the metal keg and you hold on to it and they invert you. I don't know. I don't know how big it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you can use it as a vessel. I mean, yeah, I've seen that with um, watermelons. So, and fish bowls. That's another thing, fish bowls. Anyways, well, coming back to things like why why is the, the uh, vodka more impressive than than the beer though, when it comes to chugging abilities. It's stronger, how's it more stronger? Is it, what's a good word I could use for that? Concentrated, yes, concentrated. And like, uh, not only that, besides alcohol, if you, I, if you ever read labels, right, of things and like, um, you'll see a lot of times they'll say, gosh, what's the, I bought some soda from Costco. I forget, I think it's Izzel or something like that. I don't know. But anyways, it says like, the first ingredient is apple juice, con that's water. Second ingredient is apple juice concentrate. You know, so what is apple juice concentrate? Uh, that's when you take all the apple juice goodness and you like bring it down into a smaller amount. So I, I remember like I, orange juice, you can go to a grocery store and buy those little tubes of orange juice from the frozen section and that's orange juice concentrate. So what does that mean? That means it's all the orange juice goodness, but it's concentrated. It's, it's put in a smaller volume. So hence the word concentration. Concentration is defined by amount per volume. So it's how much stuff we have over how big it is. So uh, part of the, so coming back to chemistry again, uh, one of the things about this course is it's almost like a history course. I mean, uh, we go over atoms, we talk about the, the different models. Uh, chemistry for a long time 
was what's in this stuff and what's it's made of and how much of it is is it and chemistry still is that but that's all chemistry was which is trying to figure out what's in this stuff and how much is in this stuff and i mean course chemistry is much more broad now but i mean that's that's what we did for a long time uh and you'll see that with some of the like the empirical formula i mean we used to do those back in the in the 19th century that's what chemists did they just like oh what's this compound well let's figure out what elements are in it and uh i mean among other things oxygen was actually a missing mass and we figured out oxygen was it was we couldn't find this missing it was like it was like dark matter it was like chemistry dark matter but then we we gave it the name oxygen you know of course we, we know what oxygen is now you know besides that but anyways concentration is not per volume and since chemistry is weird we um we use a specific type of uh, concentration term. We we have others. Uh, we'll talk about this more. The other ones in uh, Chem 162, but in Chem 161 we just deal with this one. And we and this is the majority of what you deal with. So molarity, molarity is defined as moles per liter. So and uh, it's the total. That's the the liter of solution. So. Uh, for instance, if I wanted to make a one molar and, and we have we use the unit capital M for molar. So use it you we for like hydrochloric acid. So we would dissolve 36.45 grams or one mole of hydrochloric acid into one liter of water. Well, the total volume would be one liter. So you bubble it in and then the total volume of the solution is one liter. And uh, so you probably put a little less water and then fill it up to one liter just to make sure it's perfect. So that would be one molar hydrochloric acid. Uh, there's other terms for concentration. For instance, there's molal, that's moles per kilogram. We'll talk about that again in 162. Uh, there's parts by volume, part by mass, and we use parts by volume and parts by mass colloquially quite a bit. So like parts by mass, like body fat percentage. So if you're 20% body fat percentage, that means it's by mass. If you're, you're 100 kilograms and you're 20% body fat, that means you're 20 kilograms of fat and the rest of you is everything else. Uh, likewise, parts by volume. Uh, actually, with alcohol, we use the term proof. So you heard the word proof. Proof is twice the parts percent by volume. So if uh, vodka is 40 proof, uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, it's 80 proof. Vodka is 80 proof, or can it can be well, it can be several different proofs. Let's say 80 proof vodka, it's two times the percent, and vodka is usually 40 percent in that range. So two times 40 percent is 80 percent, and then that's parts by volume, meaning so I could make my own uh, 80 proof vodka or 40 percent vodka by taking 40 milliliters of pure ethanol and 60 milliliters of pure water and mixing them together. And that would be my 80 proof alcoholic beverage. So, and that's by volume. So there's other ones, right? Like, like I said, but we're gonna focus on molarity. So, and again, I'm not advocating drinking. I'm advocating science because science is good. Now you're just using drinking because it is a common example, alcoholic beverages. Actually, I saw, I'm trying to figure out, I have. On my desktop of my computer, I have four articles. I'm trying to decide which one to send out to you guys tomorrow. Do you want to see one on alcohol or do you want to see more COVID stuff? I have two. You want alcohol? Okay, the alcohols have it. It's an interesting article. It's um, so uh, the way that uh, so when the way that we metabolize alcohol, we use an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. And so alcohol will turn into acid aldehyde. So it goes from alcohol to acid aldehyde and then acid aldehyde by a different uh, enzyme, it's uh, acid aldehyde ace or sorry, aldehyde ace or something. I forget the exact name, but then it, it turns from acid aldehyde into acetic acid to acetate. And uh, then our body can burn acetate. The problem with alcohol, is, is that, um, uh, well, if you've heard of alcohol poisoning, it's not really alcohol poisoning, it's acid aldehyde poisoning. Alcohol is really not that toxic, acid aldehyde is toxic, but your body can, can destroy, can, can turn 
convert alcohol to acetaldehyde very quickly, but acetaldehyde to uh, acetate, I thank you, is, is more slow. So the article is this one scientist went around and said, you know what, I want to get have a stronger, longer buzz for, and without the effects of a hangover. So instead of putting hydrogen, put heavy hydrogen. So uh, alcohol, I know we haven't covered um, uh, Lewis structures, but this is alcohol. This is ethyl alcohol, the stuff that we, we drink. This is the structure. I know we haven't covered this yet. Uh, and, and hydrogen is usually just a proton. Uh, but and hydrogen is the only one we name the isotopes. Instead of hydrogen, light hydrogen, protium, they put deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen. And it's just, it's harder to break that bond. So what the person found out was that the dehydrogenase enzyme uh, was slower to break that uh, oxygen deuterium bond. And so the alcohol level or the deuterated alcohol in his bloodstream was around longer. But then when you, when you cleave this bond and it forms and the, the enzyme forms, uh, I guess it would be, Yeah, that's right. So it forms the, I guess I should put it the other side to make the geometry better. Oop, shoot. It forms acetaldehyde. And uh, then, uh, but then the other enzyme, it works the same rate. So uh, because of that, the acetaldehyde was destroyed at a, at a faster rate than the than the deuterated alcohol, so he stayed drunk longer, and he didn't have as bad of a hangover. Of course, his drink costs like a like a couple thousand dollars. So, I don't know. Well, that's okay. I'll send that article out tomorrow. So, if you're interested, but anyways, uh, going back to chemistry, although that is chemistry, just an application of chemistry. Let's use this weird molarity. Uh, unit to, to describe something. What is the molarity of a solution containing 25.5 grams of potassium bromide dissolved enough water to make 1.75 liters of solution? So uh, just a, a review, uh, potassium, potassium is 39.1, I think, 39.1. Grams per mole and bromine. Or 79.9. Okay. Bromine is 79.9 grams per mole. So that means KBR, right? So one potassium, one bromide. So that's going to be 100 and, oh, is that 100 and, 119? Grams per mole. Am I doing that math in my head right? Yes, I am. Okay. So potassium bromide is 119 grams per mole. So, and again, the thing I'm trying to get you guys to do is a technique called dimensional analysis. So let's, so we want to know the molarity. So starting off with the, the terms we know, 25.5 grams of KBR. And then now we got to go to moles because the units we want to go is from moles per liter, KBR to 119 grams, KBR, then just unitless on the top, 1.75 liters, and uh, doing that there. So you have 25.5 divided by one, or 119 divided by 1.75, and doing so, you get 0 0.122 moles per liter, right? Because the, the grams KPR cancel equals 0 0.122 molar, and it's gonna be specifically KBR. And uh, I mean, that's the way you do the dimensional analysis. Uh, the way, if you wanna do it just by figuring it out, the way you would do that, so you want the, the molarity of that solution, you figure out the moles divided by the volume, and then you get the, uh, the concentration. So it's just because concentration is defined by amount per volume. So 
uh, you have to change the, the mass into moles and divide by the volume, and then you get the concentration right there. So again, though, I'm trying to get you to a dimensional. And if you, I guess you can do one rather than leaving it empty. If, you, if the empty space bothers, you can put one there. And that's the dimensional analysis to go through that. So mass to moles divided by volume then gives you the concentration. Questions with this one? All right. So let me show you a trick. Uh, so in some books, instead of M1, V1, you'll see C1, V1 equals C2, V2. So M is molarity, C is concentration. This, this is actually probably more versatile because it involves other unit, other terms than, than molarity. But uh, if you look at the units on this, Mole, if it's the same solution, uh, moles per liter, uh, well, moles per liter, if you have the same amount, you have moles per liter times liter equals moles per liter times liter, you just get moles equals moles. Assuming that you're not adding any more material to something, uh, you, can, you can use, oops, I have the pencil. Seems like something is running out of juice whenever I'm talking. Well, I rue the day when it's me that's running out of battery, not my Apple Pencil, I suppose. Uh, so, uh, but what was I saying? Okay, so as long as you're not adding something, any more material to, to your solution when you dilute solutions, or you may be concentrated, usually you dilute them, but you could concentrate it by like, distillation, for instance, if it's a water solution, but usually you dilute things. And uh, we do this all the time, like in chem lab. So like, uh, if you ever, if you ever wonder how, like, I mean, we, when you come to chem lab, all the solutions are prepped. Like we get, when you get something like sulfuric acid, you get this big jug, it's 18 molar, and then you dilute it down to one molar or half a molar or whatever it is you need for the lab. And the way that we figure it out is we use this equation, the M1 V1 equals M2 V2. So well, let's go ahead and do this. To what volume should you dilute 0.2 liters of a 15 molar solution to get three molar sodium hydroxide? So using this equation, so let's just put in the terms 0.2 liters times 15 molar equals are unknown, I'm just gonna give it X because that's what we always do in algebra times three, right? So you solve for X, so 0 0.2 times 15 divided by three equals X. And then let's see here, so three divided by 15 is five times 0 0.2, so that's gonna be one liter. So that one's gonna, I should put in the terms, liter, molar, molar. Right, so molars cancel, molars cancel, and uh, then the, the 15 divided by three is 5.2 times five is one, yep. So, okay, and that's, uh, yep, okay. And so actually, you know, these, these can be really easy. Um, and I know I'm not using dimensional analysis for that, but I'm using that equation instead. So a couple of things for, for using math uh, in general, especially in this class. So, uh, well, does anybody know what the fundamental theorem of algebra is? Nope. Okay, so the fundamental theorem of algebra is X to the N has N roots. And a root is where the function crosses the x-axis. So that means that this function I just drew has one, two, three, four, five, six. This one has seven. So this is going to be x to the seven. That's a, that's a polynomial, at least x to the seven if it doesn't have any imaginary roots. So uh, also, when you, when you solve systems of equations, so you have something called degrees of freedom. You need to have a single um, equation, independent equation for each degree of freedom. 
And this one here, this equation right here, it's one equation and you have one variable you're solving for. So that's the unknown. You, so if you have more than one unknown, you need to have that many independent equations. So what I mean by independent equations, so let's say you have like X equals Y or, and then, well, let's, let's do, so let me make a different one. So X plus Y equals Z. Uh, and if you say 2x plus 2y equals 2z, that's actually the same equation. So that's not, those two equations are not independent. You have to have something else. So instead of, instead of that one, you need to have like 2x plus y equals 5z. So these two, these two now you can solve, they're independent. But if you just have like, because this one is just double the first one, it's not in it. These these two are not independent. So, and that's that's a kind of a, a minor point at this point in time. But be careful for that when you're when you're setting up your equations and solving for things. It only works. So the the algebra will only work if you have the number of independent equations for the number of variables you have. So, and I oh, I know we use we use math quite a bit in this class. So that I'd. Give you that uh and why did i talk about the x the n the number of roots it's not so much this semester but next semester when you square something you now have two roots but but the thing is only one of them makes sense so that's that's where i argue with mathematicians you say math i say like math is not real you know and it's like what do you mean it's not real it just lines everything it's a model because like when you square something now you have two answers and like well, which one's right? Well, it, the one that's right is by context. And so math, math is actually in context and chemistry, I guess you could argue is a subcontext of math, but you know, we use math, but it's, it's our chemistry is real. So you can get uh, answers that don't make sense if you, if you have the math. That comes more in, con in much more in context next semester, but you'll see, you'll, you'll see that. Anyways, so, Let's look at this. So, uh, or does anybody have any questions with how to do this top part, the M1 V1 equals M2 V2? No. Okay, so if you have 50 milliliters and add a half a molar, what concentration will that be at 200 milliliters? So that means if I have, if I have my beaker and I have 50 milliliters, and then I go ahead and pour in water and now I have 200 milliliters. What is the concentration? And this one here is 0 0.5 molar. So what is this? What is this new concentration after I've added 150 milliliters to my half molar solution? Some people think A, 0.125. I mean, think B, 2.5. Everything C, half molar. Everything D, two molar. So we got someone going for A. Just need more time. I'm too fast. And you can convert to liters, you can use milliliters, it doesn't matter. I mean, this is mathematically the same thing as 0 0.05 liters times 0.5 molar equals 0.2 liters x. So another another math trick that I I do sloppy math. I just if if you multiply both sides of the equation by a factor, it's the same thing. So, uh, and you can divide it by the same factor as well. I do that all the time when I'm doing math in my head. 
So like if I want to do the math here in my head, I would probably divide it by 10 both sides and I have five times 0.5 equals 20 X. And that means then X equals five divided by 20 times 0.5. And five divided by 20 is a fourth and the 0.5 is an eighth. So this would be one fourth times one half is one eighth. And then I think you can guess what the answer is from there. So, although I just, I gave, I gave away the answer. Does everyone see why it's A? Anybody have any questions? Oh, we got a chat in the Zoom. Yeah, um, I think the screen might be glitching. Pay attention to the Zoom. Screen is glitching. It's for some reason. Okay. It's not showing like the full are you guys page. zoom or is you having a hard time we just couldn't oh, no, i had the oh that's right. like, i turned off the yeah we can't see the left side of the screen okay sorry i can i have my sound off <laughs> um is everything okay for you guys you can't see the multiple choice so can you see it now It's like the left quarter of the screen is kind of just like cut off almost and. Okay, let me do this. Is that working now? Yeah, it looks like it, thank you. Okay. I just unshared the screen, I shared it again. So at least I know. And it's okay now that I've zoomed in? Yep, looks good on my end, thank you. Okay. The chat. Okay, perfect, all right. So uh, this chapter deals with solutions and I guess I should also even go back and, and define what a solution is. So a solution is a homogeneous mixture. So that's a definition of a solution. A solution is a homogeneous mixture. Uh, and uh, whatever we have the most of something, that is also known as a solvent. And whatever we have the smaller amount of, that's called the solute. And you can have several solutes in the same solvent. So uh, of course, it's easiest to describe um, just they're two part systems, something like sugar water or salt water. But if you look at ocean water, for instance, uh, depends on where you're at in the ocean. But generally speaking, the ocean is about 96.5% water and about 3.5% salts. So it's, it's mostly sodium chloride uh, salt. And sodium chloride, of course, that's a salt that comes in salt shakers. And colloquially, when we say salt, we mean sodium chloride salt. Uh, and in ocean water is no exception. It's mostly sodium chloride salt, but it has other stuff in it. it has magnesium in it, has iodine in it, uh, various other things. So it's a, it's a mixture. So for ocean water, ocean water, the solvent, what's doing the dissolving is water. And then the solute, I know that there's more stuff in there, but I just for simplicity purposes, I'll say that it's a sodium chloride. So sodium chloride is the solute in ocean water. And also sometimes you'll see certain products claiming to be solvent free. So uh, that usually that's like, uh, you'll see that in the stores, like, oh, solvent free stuff. And if it's a solution, then it's, it's impossible for it to be solvent free. It usually means it doesn't have any hydrocarbons in it. So that's more of a environmental concern. So there's a lot of things that happen uh, that use chemistry terms, but are not really, you know, proper use of chemistry and solvent free stuff is another thing. Organic is another one. So organic is a legal definition. It's nothing to do. Organic just means carbon containing in chemistry class. So, or at least to, to the science of chemistry, 
whereas organic carries with it a very specific set of circumstances. So solvent free, I guess, is another one. And uh, so we're going to mostly talk about aqueous solutions. So solutions with water and water based solutions are very important for planet Earth because over two thirds of the surface is covered in water. And it's very important for life because we have a lot of different types of aqueous solutions in our body. So water based solutions are very important and much of chemistry deals with this. So, uh, and I always think whenever I see this, I always think, have you, anyone ever seen the movie um, uh, Idiocracy? Or am I getting too old in this crowd? Like, um, I think it's because people Yep, that's the one. No, it doesn't have Adam Sandler, it has Luke Wilson. Yeah, so, um, so if you remember Brando, Brando has electrolytes because that's what plants crave. So uh, what are electrolytes though? So electrolytes are things that make water conduct. So uh, water, pure water, absolutely pure water is considered to be a non-electrolyte. Although pure water, it's, it's a very, very, very weak electrolyte, but we consider it to be a non-electrolyte. What does the chat want? I got no tattoo. <laughs> Not sure. Yes. Um, so uh, anyway, so um, certain things that you add to water make water a strong electrolyte, and that means it conducts electricity well. So salt, sodium chloride salt is an example of one. And salts in general, the ones that dissolve are strong electrolytes. So for instance, Gatorade, Gatorade and other sports drinks, so 100 plus or something like that, other sports drinks, they contain electrolytes in them. And oh, even um, coconut water, I haven't tried to see what the conductivity of coconut water is. I just like to drink it. I haven't brought it in the lab, but um, potassium, potassium is a strong electrolyte. It means it makes water conduct electricity. So whereas water, generally speaking, does not conduct electricity, but when you add stuff to it, it can like strong electrolytes, uh, so salts are strong electrolytes and strong acids and strong bases are strong electrolytes. So they make water conduct electricity really, really well. Uh, then there's a weak electrolyte. So a weak electrolyte is something that makes electricity conduct a little bit. I, I think Dr. Fisher is going to do this lab. He usually does where he looks at the different electrolytes. I don't know if you guys, I, I didn't quite look at his schedule because of uh, the pandemic and all. Did, have you done this lab where you, you look at the electrolyte? Oh, you haven't done it yet? Okay. So uh, you, you have weak electrolytes, so vinegar. So weak acids, weak bases. Uh, so ammonia and vinegar would be weak electrolytes. So they conduct better than pure water, but when you have a solution of vinegar and or uh, uh, ammonia, you'll get a weak electrolyte. And do I have a picture of it? Yeah, here we go. So when you have a weak electrolyte, and you know, this even uses vinegar as an example. So strong electrolyte, you can see you have this, uh, the, the leads, the electrical leads hooked up into water and the strong electrolyte, the light bulb uh, glows really brightly. Weak electrolyte, it glows ever so slightly. And then a non-electrolyte, uh, either pure water or substances that don't conduct electricity in pure water do not conduct. So a weak electrolyte, you can see here, it's, I don't know if you see it, there's, there's a strong electrolyte, it's nice and bright. Weak electrolyte, it's dim. Non-electrolyte, it's not, it's not conducting. So what's, and then I mentioned non-electrolyte. Non-electrolyte is something that does not, conduct, does not conduct electricity. So what's going on on a molecular level? So strong electrolytes, they create ions. So remember ions are positively charged atoms or groups of atoms, also known as molecules. A molecule is a stable group of atoms. So uh, because you have those positive and negative charges, those ions, that means that electricity can flow in between them. So then electrons can flow through uh, when you have positive negative ions. So weak electrolyte, uh, so strong electrolyte, it greatly breaks apart into positive and negative ions. A weak electrolyte means it little bit breaks apart. It likes to stay molecular, it likes to stay together, but ever so a little bit, it'll break apart. 
And the non-electrolyte just means that the molecule just stays put, doesn't break apart. So, uh, and later on, we'll talk more about acids and bases in the next semester, but uh, a strong acid, uh, it's, it's like, it's like a ride share. It's like two, if you've ever done, I don't know if you do this in, in Hawaii, in the mainland, you can do like Uber ride share. I mean, I know we have Uber here, but like you can get in the car with a bunch of different people. And if you're all going to the same place kind of stuff, you'll, you'll get like a carpooling. And it's like the Uber ride share uh, is like a strong electrolyte. Like they hang like hydrogen and chlorine for hydrochloric acid. It's a strong acid. It just, it likes to kind of like, oh, hang on. The most of the water appears. Hydrogen and chlorine just break apart, They're like flying off. Like, I want nothing to do with you. Buy, buy hydrogen, buy chlorine, have a nice life kind of thing. They have no, no ability to really hang out at all. A weak electrolyte, this is like a disgusting couple. Okay, so this is like you go, you go to got with, with disgusting couple. What are they doing? They're holding hands, they're kissing, they're always right next to each other. And then someone's like, I could go to the bathroom. Like, okay, I'll wait here for you, you know, and anxiously wait for the person. And then the guys like that, oh, I was, I waited a whole two minutes for you. Where were you two? You know, that's a weak electrolyte. So it, it really just, it likes to stay together, but every so a little bit, it'll slightly break apart. And then, and then as soon as it has a chance though, it'll form a molecule. And then I got a molecule. A molecule is defined by a stable group of atoms. So versus an unstable group of atoms, so think about couples. So there's a stable couple and then there's unstable couples. How would you describe a stable couple? Stable couples like, I'm here, the other partner's here, we're okay. Unstable couple is, I'm here, partner's here, right? They fall apart. So same thing with unstable molecules. Unstable molecules fly apart. So weak electrolytes, they will break apart a little bit, but they like to stay together. The non-electrolytes, non-electrolytes are just like, nah, we're not moving. Not moving at all. So that would be like the, the worst couple imaginable. I don't know, I guess it depends on your definition of worst. They would not leave each other's side to do anything. So that is the non-electrolyte. It's a, it's a group of atoms that just stays together, does not ionize, does not break apart. It stays the way it is. So, uh, so examples of non-electrolytes, sugars. Sugars, does, sugars don't ionize, ethylene glycol, uh, that's a non-electrolyte. Alcohol, that's a non-electrolyte. So alcohol, water mixtures don't really uh, conduct. So, and, and they really don't. Uh, so for instance, um, my grandmother told me the story. She was swimming in a lake one time and then the lake got struck by lightning. Uh, and she said she felt a little bit of a, like a kind of electrical discharge, but it wasn't really that much at all. And bolts of lightning, I mean, they have thousands of amps and tens of thousands of volts. And I mean, she could have, I mean, if she was struck by lightning, you know, then that, that could have been game over, you know, and I would have never been here. But, uh, you know, the, 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 there, at least there wasn't enough salts in the, uh, in the lake that it conducted enough electricity that, sh that uh, she was electrocuted. And she didn't, I mean, wasn't even enough to defibrillate her. Which can happen. That's you got to be careful with electricity. If it hits you at the right time, it can it can change your heartbeat. Okay, but uh, all right, back to solutions. So, and this is something actually solutions we're still trying to figure out, uh, especially and we're doing a lot of research on this, especially when it comes to life. I, I have a vested interest in astronomy. If some of you guys uh, know, I um, and much of astronomy now is looking for life. And there's just some things that happen that only happen in solution. Uh, there are certain types of reactions called uh, elimination reactions. That's when you form double and triple bonds, double, triple carbon bonds. And it looks like right now, it's, it's very, very unlikely to form those in anything but a solution. Sometimes you can get them randomly, but basically you need to have some sort of solution to, to form those. And uh, that's important for life because we have lots of molecules that have double and triple bonds in them, at least between carbon atoms. So, but uh, the solutions come from the interaction. So, and why do stuff dissolve? Uh, well, in general, uh, the interaction between the ions and the, and the solvents 
is greater than the interactions themselves. And, and I know we, we, uh, we jump all over the place, especially in the beginning of the, of the chapter or in the beginning of the semester. And uh, if you look here, this is, this is a water molecule. And uh, we haven't talked about this, but water is a molecule type called polar, meaning it has a positive end and a negative end. So what's going on, and again, we'll talk more about this later, the oxygen is an electron sink. It's drawing a lot of electron density to it. Maybe I should do it with yellow. So I'm changing colors. So if you can see this, then you can't see this at all. Shoot, <laughs> it just looks yellow. Okay. Um, I'll just, oops. so I'll have to use my Pictionary skills or put the test. So the electron, the electrons we'll learn later are more like a fuzzy cloud. The electron density flows towards the oxygen. It flows towards this direction of the molecule. And then because of that, you get a buildup of negative charge on the oxygen end of the molecule. Whereas the hydrogen end, there is, it's electron poor. And then the electrons, it's a, like a fuzzy cloud, but there's still the plain old positive charge from the, uh, the proton there. And so because of that, and the protons don't move very much at all, their wave functions are much more defined to the nucleus. So because of that, this molecule ends up with a positive end and a negative end. And then with, so why does sodium chloride dissolve in water? Well, what happens is six water molecules surround each of the ions. And uh, it's a partial, so it's a partial positive, partial negative, partial means less than 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. That's the charge of a proton or negative charge of an electron. But six of those, six of those charges is about equal or greater than the, uh, the charge of the proton or electron respectively. And when that happens, things will dissolve. And why am I going through this right now? Because later on we're gonna talk about solubility rules. So why things dissolve in water or what, what dissolves in water, what doesn't. And generally speaking, the big, small charged uh, ions and our molecules, those are the ones that, that'll, that are soluble. So the big ones, the big ones with small charges, plus ones, the, the plus ones, the minus ones. So like, uh, and we have, so we haven't talked about this yet, but sodium, uh, the alkalis are big atoms. So they're big atoms, big, big diffuse positive charges. Uh, it's easy to get, so it's easy to get alkalized and dissolve. Uh, same thing with halogens. Halogens even mean salt forming in Greek. So it's easy to make halogen salts soluble. Uh, but the ones that are not soluble are the ones that have the big charges. So almost everything, I mean, with, the, with a few exceptions, oh geez, Apple pencil. With a few, few exceptions, um, usually the, the, uh, the, the charge is really greater than one. They tend not to be very soluble at all. So it's really, it's really the plus ones, minus ones. Okay, and uh, okay, so back to solutions. We have strong electrolyte, weak electrolyte, non-electrolyte. So now you know why things dissolve uh, and why, uh, why sugar dissolves. And sugar itself is also a polar molecule. You, if you look at, uh, if you can see the red colors, those are oxygens and those are OHs, hydroxides. And those are all polar ends of the molecule. So then the water can easily, have an attraction, the, the sugar and the water have attractions to each other. So then that way it'll, it'll easily jump in the solution. Besides the fact, sugar is also a molecule, so versus an ion. So that means that the attraction between sugar molecules are not very strong. So again, we learned this in next semester, but uh, the amount of attractiveness between molecules is also defined by the, the states, so solid liquid gas. So it's, it's pretty easy to melt sugar. I mean, it gets hot. I mean, but you can melt sugar on your stove top. Um, you can't melt salt, like sodium chloride salt. You're not gonna be able to melt that. I mean, like rocks, like rocks or most rocks are ionic compounds. Um, it takes a lot of heat to melt rocks, right? I mean, lava is really, really hot. Surprising things we learned in chemistry class today, lava is hot. So, and the reason why lava is so hot, it's, why molten rock is so hot, because it needs lots of energy. Heat equals energy. You need lots of energy to break that attraction. So the attraction between non-electrolytes is not that great versus ionic compounds. Okay, so 
What is? Is ions? Yeah. Is it? Ions are conductive. So a lot when you can conduct a particle. Yeah, it would be. So, uh, but for a different reason, um, lava is not an aqueous solution per se, but let's, so if you, if you look at, at this picture here, you have the, so like I'm looking at the center there, the sodium chloride lattice. So this is a solid. So solid means defined shape, definite shape, defined volume. If you have liquid ions, like a, like lava, so molten lava, that means that the the ions are gonna are the for a molten rock, the ions are free to flow. And as long as ions are free to flow, it's gonna conduct electricity. So yes, if you can get a wire that's that's can handle the heat, uh, at least a, like a it could be a metal like platinum or thorium, something that has really high melting point, you could you you could use lava to conduct. <laughs> So, okay. So, which aqueous solutions conduct electricity? So, uh, looking at the type. So, looking at first here, uh, one molar potassium bromide. Uh, potassium bromide. This is an ion. This is an ionic compound. It's a metal nonmetal. It's a salt. And uh, so, there's two definitions. Remember, two definitions of salt. One is metal and a nonmetal. That's ion oxide or hydroxide. And then a um, Another one is uh, the result of an acid-base neutralization reaction. So, but potassium bromide is a solid, it forms ions. So this one is yes. So potassium bromide will form an electrical conductive solution. Next we have glucose. Well, I guess it's just a hexose. It could be fructose or mannose or some other uh, ose, but uh, We'll just go with glucose. So one molar glucose solution. Uh, glucose is a sugar. This is a molecule. And uh, so uh, this one here, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a non-conduct. It's going to be non-electrolyte. This is going to be no. Uh, then we have methanol. And I would consider this to be non-conducting. Non Let's see what the book says. I would consider it no, which, okay, it doesn't tell you. So uh, it was just because this, this OH is considered to be an acidic hydrogen. It's not gonna, it's not gonna break apart. In water, it won't. I'll go ahead and say no. Uh, this is, again, that's a molecule. That's not a, it's not a weak, say it was formic acid. So if it was, see, if it, if it was this, that's formic acid. That's, um, that's what's also in, in ant bites. That's a weak electrolyte. That would be a little bit. That would be a little. But uh, I guess if it's just conduct electricity, this is this is a no. So, okay. How about we answer questions? No questions. Okay. And if you remember my long soliloquy talking about solutions and why things dissolve, and um, I should also say another point. Uh, there are other types of solutions other than aqueous. We're gonna talk mostly about aqueous solutions, but you can have solutions of gases. So air, air is considered a solution. So solutions are homogeneous mixtures. So air is a solution, it's a gas solution, and you have mixtures, you have a mixture of gas. You can have solid solutions as well. So alloys, so Carbon steel, 2% carbon, 98% iron. That's a metal solution. Uh, 14 karat gold, 18 karat gold, 10 karat gold. Those are different mixtures of uh, copper, silver, and gold. And so that's when we use the carats. So, I mean, 24 carats, pure gold, but the different, it's typical to find 10, 14, and 18 carats. They just have different concentrations of, of uh, copper, silver, and gold in them. Uh, also different types of gold. You can have green gold, which has no copper in it. No, I'm sorry, yeah, green gold has no copper. Uh, rose gold has gold and copper, no silver, for instance. So you can have different colors of gold as well and different, those are all solutions. Uh, another one, brass, bronze, right? So you have different alloys. Those are, those are solid solutions. So we're sticking with liquid water solutions. Now uh, let's talk about, uh, so here, here is the solubility chart. And uh, the, um, so 
I, again, I, I guess I'm, I think I'm teaching you guys logic. If you look at this chart, the way to, way to read this chart. So you look at the top part, the top part says, these are the general trends for when, when it will happen, when you will have things that are soluble and soluble means it'll dissolve. So, and then the bottom part is these things tend to be insoluble. Insoluble means not soluble. So in these circumstances, you're not gonna form a solution. You're not gonna form a uh, homogeneous mixture. So uh, now I'll start off with here, you see the top line, you have lithium, sodium, potassium. What are those? Those are the alkali metals. Also ammonium, the NH4 plus. So these things are always soluble. So salts that, that have lithium, sodium, potassium, also rubidium, cesium, maybe francium. Of course, francium only exists for a few microseconds. So all the alkali metals, they are always soluble in water. So those salts are always soluble in water. Same thing with ammonium. So why are these soluble? Because they're big. They're big and they have a small charge. So it's easy to, that means that the, on, on contrast is, that means that the ionic bond is gonna be relatively weak. It also means the melting point is gonna be relatively low compared to other salts. So of course that, that logic comes later. Then also same thing with nitrates and acetates. So nitrate, the NO3 minus so is a nitrate and acetate. Next one, these are always, always soluble. So whenever you have a mix, like a salt that's mixed with that, they're always soluble. And even so for, for big, heavy metal ions like lead. So lead nitrate, lead acetate, lead tends to be pretty insoluble, but lead nitrate and lead acetate are fairly soluble. There's even, uh, there's the Grecian formula for hair coloring. If, you've, if you're familiar with that, you can color hair dark using uh, Grecian formula. Grecian formula is lead acetate. And it forms lead sulfide. If you're wondering how the Grecian formula works, it forms lead, lead sulfide precipitates in your hair. And that's why it turns it dark. Okay, so next on the list are the halogens. And you see not, not including fluoride. Uh, so why are we not including fluoride? Uh, because fluoride forms hydrofluoric acid. So in water, it'll it'll react and form hydrofluoric acid. And it's a little more complicated. So we're just gonna skip out on that for the time being. But in generally speaking, it is, fluorides tend to be soluble, but uh, the chlorides, bromides, and iodides, so the halides, so halogens, halides tend to be soluble, uh, but we have exceptions. The exceptions are silver, mercury, and lead. So a specific ion, silver plus one, dimercury plus two ion, and lead plus two ion, these ones are, the, with the mixture of those, those are insoluble compounds. And then sulfates, sulfates in general tend to be uh, soluble with the exception of the heavy alkaline earths, so strontium, barium, also lead, silver, and, oh, well, let's see here. This is, oh, so, okay, it's just alkaline earths. So uh, strontium, barium, I don't know why they've been put calcium next to it. So, uh, but calcium, strontium, barium, lead and silver sulfates are all insoluble. But magnesium sulfate is actually is soluble. It's also in its Epsom salts. Another lab I think you'll end up doing. Okay, so that's the, so top is generally soluble, means it will dissolve in water. Bottom is generally insoluble. So hydroxides and sulfides are insoluble with the exception of, of course, if you see then lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium, because there's no exceptions for those. And then sulfides combined with the alkaline earths are soluble and hydroxides uh, with the alkaline earths tend to be slightly soluble. And then carbonates and phosphates these tend to be insoluble with the exception of the alkalis and ammonia. So again, the general trend, as I mentioned before, is the small charges with the big atoms, or it's just the big, the big ions uh, with the small charges, those are the ones that tend to be soluble. So that means, so like the ammonium, you have the positive charge spread over five atoms, and the uh, the the positive charge that just alkalis or big atoms and big ions in general. Uh, same thing with the negative ions, the, the nitrate and the acetate, those are 
molecules and this, the negative charge is spread out over that. So uh, those are big molecules. When you start getting the, the larger charges like carbonate with minus two and phosphate minus three, it's just hard to get that stuff to dissolve because it's not, it's the, the attractiveness between the, the ions is stronger than the attraction with water. Okay, so let's let's use this chart to to predict some things. So I'll just go ahead. Let me just write on the side. So PBCl2, copper chloride, that's a VU, calcium nitrate, and barium sulfate. Okay. So let's use this chart and apply the logic. So lead chloride, uh, here's chloride. And so it tends to be soluble, but there's an exception. So since, so chlorides in general tend to be soluble, but lead plus two, and this is in fact, PBCL2 is in fact lead two chloride because chlorides tend to be minus one. So the two minus ones means that lead is plus two. So this is a plus two lead. And because of this, because of the exception, this, I'm gonna put I for insoluble. So lead chloride is an insoluble salt. So what this means is it doesn't dissolve in water. So like sand, sand is silicon dioxide or, or I guess calcium carbonate here in Hawaii. So sand and water don't mix, right? Sand is insoluble to water. But salt, sodium chloride is soluble, it dissolves. So if we had a beach with lead chloride, it would be a weird beach, but it would, it would, it would be, it would sit there, would not dissolve in water. Does everyone understand the logic here, how you get there? So chlorides tend to be insoluble, but then we have the exception of lead, and lead then makes this because of the exception, it becomes exception, it becomes insoluble. Okay, copper chloride. So we found chloride, we found chlorides. And uh, so copper chloride should be soluble. It's not listed. Copper is not listed as one of these exceptions. So because of that, copper chloride is in fact, it would be copper two chloride. Copper two chloride would be soluble. You can dissolve this. And it's a really pretty blue solution as well, I might add. It's like a light, light blue. So it depends on how concentrated it is, but it, it's a light blue solution. Copper is pretty. So a lot of transition metals are really pretty. Copper is a, I like blue. Copper has a really pretty blue to it. Or copper solutions, I should say. Also copper rocks. Like if you, one of the old copper ores is azurite. So azure, like blue. So, but do you see now the logic why copper chloride is in fact soluble? Because chlorides tend to be soluble and copper is not listed as an exception. So questions? Okay, calcium nitrate. So we have next next one is calcium nitrate. And so we have, I oh, can't see that. Here's nitrate. So, and there are no exceptions to the rule. If it's a nitrate, it's soluble. Therefore, calcium nitrate is soluble. So uh, next one is sulfate, barium sulfate. And we're down here. Sulfates tend to be soluble, but barium means insoluble. So barium sulfite is in fact insoluble. And if anyone has anyone ever had a CT scan before, I have at least of my GI tract. They use barium sulfate as a contrast agent for X-rays. So either an X-ray or for a, like a, a CT scan. Um, and you can drink barium tends to be really toxic. Uh, but barium sulfate is insoluble, so you can drink, you can eat and drink all the barium sulfate you want. Uh, it's not gonna, it's not gonna break apart, and the barium is not gonna poison you. So, uh, and I can tell you, the stuff tastes terrible. It's horrible. That's iodine. Yeah, that's uh, also for X-rays. So they use the the, the big heavy uh, atoms or elements for contrasting agent they use so it's more the barium so i mean like if you if you want something to shine at least well contrast with an x-ray i mean i mean lead would work really well right but lead's really toxic so and That's why you it in i i have no reaction to iodine whatsoever so i don't know oh, okay. 
Yeah. Yeah, I it doesn't bother me one bit. They I I've had two CT scans and they took me up there. Oh, you might feel warm, you might taste something. I'm like, nope, feel nothing. Yeah, I like I said, I mean, I have no reaction to it, but apparently that's common. So, like I said, I can't empathize. But so, anybody have any questions? I was also told you have to you feel like you have to to pee too. Okay. Again, like I said. Or maybe I should be proper. You feel an urge to micturate. I guess that would be the proper way. All right. So next thing we're talking about are precipitation reactions. So if you remember back, we're talking about uh about um how do you say the uh chemical properties versus physical properties. So Physical properties involve things that do not involve a, uh, that you measure without a exchange of atoms. So density, color, right? You can observe the color of my blue jeans. It has the indigo dye on it. So you can notice the, I can stand up. You can notice the indigo dye of my jeans uh, and you observe it without doing anything. My jeans are also flammable, but if you catch my jeans on fire, they're no longer jeans, no longer cotton and indigo you know it's now something else probably carbon dioxide and water you know kind of thing so uh that's chemical property now with with a uh with a precipitation reaction so a chemical reaction happens when atoms exchange and the evidence for a precipitation reaction is a precipitate means it falls down so it's uh, uh i guess i should have oh. I wonder if I should have brought up something to react. Um, so if you take two solutions and you pour them together, uh, a precipitation reaction, and, and like shown in the picture here, you form this, in this case, a yellow precipitate, and it falls down. It falls down in solution. You can also have something called a supplicant. A supplicant floats. So, but generally speaking, uh, there's there tends to be more, well, at least in chemistry class, we tend to have more precipitates than supplicants. So, but... Uh, also some terminology. So uh, we have the alkali metals and we have the alkaline earths. So what does it mean to have alkaline earths? Why did the, why did the um, what is it called? The alchemists, why do they call alkaline earths? Well, because when you have two solutions made with alkaline earths and you mix them together, they tend to form precipitates. So the old earth, wind, fire, water, you have water and you pour these water solutions together and you get a solid forming that's the like the the earth forming so it's the earth it's not really earth you know it's the but it's the you know the the symbol well the symbol for earth is this it's it's the circle with a plus so that's the that's the symbol for earth and so you had the alkaline metals that have earth in them so they generate dirt earth and so it's really saying they're they're just not as soluble as the alkaline metals where the alkaline and earth come from. Anyways, so when you look at a precipitation reaction, so if you look here, we have potassium iodide, and I'll make this bigger so you can see it, potassium iodide, and then lead nitrate. So remember, all alkalis are soluble, so all potassium salts are soluble, all nitrate salts are soluble, and then you mix them together, you mix them together, and then uh, lead iodide. So if you mix these two together, you're going to get lead iodide, and it's a solid. And then that's the precipitate. So it falls down in solution. So in generally speaking, solids, most solids tend to be heavier than water, at least certainly in the inorganics. So inorganic meaning like you know rocks, things that don't have don't have carbon in them, like plastic. Plastic is organic. Plastic can float, but rocks tend to sink in, in water. So that's why it floats down the precipitate. And uh, excuse the, the heteronormality with this, but it just makes it easier to explain. The reason why uh, a chemical reaction happens is at least a precipitation reaction happens. So if you have 
And I'm just kind of listing kind of the, the positive ion, kind of like a boy, negative ion, kind of like a girl. And then you can have a partner exchange reaction. And the question is, if, if these, these sort of a soluble, do you form a compound that's insoluble? And uh, so what you're not going to have, you're not going to have the two positive, you're not going to have this situation because they're two positive charges. Likewise, you're not going to have the two negative charges because they repel. So positive and negative attract. So positive, positive, negative, negative, repel. So the question is, when you mix these two ionic solutions, are you going to form a new compound that's insoluble? And then the evidence for the chemical reaction is the formation of a new compound that's not soluble. So when you do these, you have to, so if you decide whether or not something is soluble or not, you have to look at this, you have to do the, the exchange. So, uh, so we have uh, potassium carbonate and nickel chloride. So in this case, we're gonna have, uh, so you have K2CO3, three plus nickel chloride. This would then form, I guess I should, I should be proper and put the aqueous. So these are aqueous. Uh, and we're gonna form KCl plus, and I'm just, cause right, the, this one is gonna, so the, the positive is gonna interact with the negative, And then this one is interact with that. We're gonna form KCl and then nickel carbonate, so positive one first. But if I wanted to balance it, it's just gonna be two there for KCl. But the question is, is potassium chloride soluble and is nickel carbonate soluble? So potassium chloride's easy. All alkalis are soluble. So then we put aqueous, Oop, that's an ugly, I put QA, aqueous. So potassium chloride is soluble. And then the question is nickel carbonate. So you come back up here to the chart and you'll get the chart, you know, right, open books. Carbonates tend to be insoluble and nickel is not listed as an exception. So that means that nickel carbonate is in fact, it's a precipitate and it will fall out in solution. Uh, old school listed a down arrow. So that's what they used to do in chemistry textbooks is put a down arrow for this. Some, some countries, I know Vietnam, they do it as well because I had a Vietnamese student say like, we do that in Vietnam. She obviously had chemistry before. So, okay. Uh, questions with this, how to do that? So remember only the positive ions and the negative ions interact. They interact with the opposite charges. They don't interact with the same charges. So the, the potassium nickel will not form a compound and the chloride and carbonate will not form a compound. Uh, so let me then look at this one here. So we have then sodium nitrate, I'm not gonna put this, the states, lithium sulfate. This is gonna form, you know, so the, the uh, sodium is gonna mix with the sulfate and they'll form two there if you if you must know because sulfate's minus four or I'm sorry minus two and then sodium is plus one and then we're going to get uh, lithium nitrate so like so okay uh, and so let's look at sodium sulfate sodium sulfate uh, well sodium there's it's an alkali all alkalis are soluble so all alkalis are soluble, that's aqueous. Lithium nitrate, lithium is an alkali. All alkalis are soluble. So what happens here, this is no, and sometimes you see written like this, no reaction. RxN is sometimes chemistry shorthand for reaction. So meaning I mix them together and nothing happens. So there's lots of things that, I mean, it's, we learn all this stuff in chemistry class, but I mean, really, I mean, a lot of chemical reactions, a lot of times you mix stuff, nothing happens, right? What happens when you mix 
if I had a solution of sugar and water and a solution of salt and water, what happens when I mix them together? Does anything happen? No, nothing happens. You get salty, sweet water. You don't get any bubbles or anything going on. You, you mix vinegar with a solution of, of uh, sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, you mix those together, you get bubbles forming, right? Something happens, that's a chemical reaction, something happened. But most of the time when you mix stuff, nothing happens. So you get nothing happens as well. So that's a no reaction. And the reason is because the mixtures that could happen from that, they do not form a compound that, that, would, not long, that would not be soluble in water. Whereas the top one, or, or at least the, the first one, the, the potassium carbonate and the nickel chloride, that does form nickel carbonate, which is insoluble and will drop in solution. So questions? All right, let's see if you can figure this out. So cobalt chloride mixes in lead nitrate. What's made? Actually, I guess I could, let me copy this. And I'll bring you back up to the chart. Oop, and you can't see that as well. There you go. I'll just put it there. So we have copper chloride and lead nitrate. What if anything happens to this mysterious mixture? How many think we form A, copper nitrate? How many think B, we form lead chloride? Okay, how many think C, dichlorine nitrate? How many think D, no reaction? So we have majority of the class voting for B, and I'm gonna say you guys are getting it. And the reason is you are gonna form copper nitrate you'll form copper nitrate in lead chloride. And lead, lead chloride is in fact insoluble, so then that's gonna fall down. Uh, this one, C is not proper because that's two anions. Two anions are negatively charged, they have no attraction. They have, they have repulsion for each other and there is, no, there is no no not reaction. There actually is a reaction, so B is a proper answer. Questions of this? Okay, so, all right. I guess we got, anybody have any, we have a chat. B, yep, it's B. Um, we have one minute left. Anybody have anything to say? Last minute class? Nope. All right, then. Let's end here then. And I will stop recording. So see you guys on Monday. How do I? Stop